you have the speaker on? Uh, a little... I think so. Because you yeah. have to record. To... Yes. You, you can hear me. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this new colloquia at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalusia. And today we have the, the talk by uh, Eleonora Fiorellino uh, from the Observatorio Astronomico Capo di Monte in Napoli, but she's a postdoc in Rome to now. And she will talk about the measuring accretional rate on place one protostars. So Eleonora will be introduced by uh, Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming again to a new Severo to our colloquium. Um, so thanks a lot. And first of all, thanks, thanks to our speaker today, uh, Dr. Eleonora Pirolino. Thank you very much for having accepted our, our invitation to, to this program from the Severo Choa Excellence Award at the IAA. <laughs> Eleonora, Eleonora Fiorellino is since 2022 postdoctoral fellow at INAF, uh, as uh, René said, at the Observatorio Astronomico Capodimonte in Napoli, under the Twin Project Strait with the uh, enough jetty collaboration. She was born in Rome and she studied at the Università degli Studi di Roma, La Sapienza, uh, and graduating for the Bachelor in Physics in 2014 and the Master in Physics and Astrophysics in, in 2017. She won a scholarship at the Rome PhD program <clears throat> in Astronomy, Astrophysics and Space Science, hosted by the Star Formation Group of the INAF Instituto de Astrophysica Planetologia Spaziale and INAF Observatorio Astronomico di Roma. During her PhD, she obtained an ESO, ESO study, studentship in, in Garhin. Uh, she defended her PhD thesis um, during COVID, so that's uh, extra points, I guess. The 23rd of December 2020, so a precious uh, Christmas uh, present for herself, I guess, uh, about star formation um, from the pre stellar course to the accretion of young stellar objects. She worked at uh, Konkoli Observatory in Hungary until 2022 under the ERC funded position Sacred. And since her PhD, she studies how stars and planets form. And today she will talk about the evolution of accretion processes, as, as you know. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eleonora Fiorellino, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, actually, thanks for inviting me. I hope you will enjoy uh, this colloquium. So uh, as been said before, uh, I'm going to talk about how to measure the accretion rate and I will focus on a particular stage, the class one stage. Uh, in order to uh, justify this, uh, let me do some, not working, meeting, okay. Okay. Okay, let me do some introduction. Um, uh, I'm sorry for the expert, maybe this is boring, but uh, it is what it is. So I'm gonna focus on low mass stars. Uh, let's define what we mean by low, uh, everything smaller, well, less massive than two solar masses. Um, at the very beginning, um, we uh, are interested in the so-called first stellar phase. So at this stage, the objects that we study uh, are just made of gas and dust. So there is no star here. Um, and the FCD um, uh, distribution looks like that. So we can study that in the submillimeter. Uh, this is important. This stage is important because, according to the uh, current star formation mm -hmm. scenario, when these objects um, are enough self -gravi gravitating, they can collapse. They can collapse, producing actual um, protostars. And um, the uh, what we mean by the protostellar phase is actually class zero and class one uh, objects. Uh, during this stage, there is a forming star where the hydrogen burning is not there. In uh, at all, but still there is gas and dust with a certain temperature, but everything is surrounded by a dusty envelope and a circumstellar disk. At the class zero stage, the envelope is so thick that we cannot see through it, so we cannot see either the um, photosphere of the forming object or the disk. And then by the time this envelope dissipates, and during the class ones, we start seeing both the circumstellar disk and some contribution also of the forming star. <clears throat> However, uh, the situation is still a lot complicated, as you can see from the SCD. 
And it's only uh, during the priming sequence stars, composed them by the class two and the class three, then the envelope basically is all dissipated. And you can study in detail the circumstellar disk and also the photosphere of the forming star. Um, the, the class three is defined as the very last stage uh, where the deuterium bur uh, uh, burning um, occurs into the star right before uh, the main sequence, the main sequence uh, stage. Okay, so um, this scenario that I just described um, is very not efficiency. Uh, if we um, um, study how much material there is during the first phase, and then we compare it with the uh, mass that we observe in mean sequence space, we've got this number. So uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, there are several ways, but to do this, I will show you just um, this plot, just to give you an idea on how this uh, is computed. So in the black, you can see the initial mass function, so the statistical mass distribution of main sequence stars. And in the um, blue, the uh, core mass function, the statistical mass distribution of crystallar cores. This is an example for serpent star forming region, but you can see there are at least um, a lot of similar studies. And uh, in all the cases, what we get is that uh, during the star formation process, more than half of the crystallar core masses do not contribute to the main sequence stars. So um, the, the key message here is that um, the star formation uh, like core collapse is not efficient uh, and it's not efficient mode to form star and is also uh, like not by only this that the stars gain all their mass. So the question came naturally how? how stars collect their mass, what, what, what's happened during the, 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 the stages that I list before. Um, there are several theories, and for the moment, uh, the, the ones that we like, like the most, um, because it's more or less working, is the magnetospheric equation scenario. So according to this scenario, from the, the material, from the envelope, arise into the um, circumstellar disk, it arrives on the autumn part of the circumstellar disk, and then it reaches the inner part. There are um, questions marked here because we, we at the moment, we don't know what is the physical mechanism that drives this um, migration of the material from the autumn part to the inner part. The point is that uh, when the, um, the gas and dust is in the inner part of the disk, it um, encounters the uh, magnetic field lines of the forming object, and by following them, it shocks into the central object, um, accreting its mass. Now, all of this is, um, is happening uh, while the star is rotating. And uh, as you know, uh, in order to <clears throat> uh, conserve the angular momentum, if something is creating the uh, young stellar object, so it has the composition of both the forming star, the disk and the envelope, something should uh, get uh, should be ejected as well. And there are some, uh, indeed, winds uh, and jets. <clears throat> um, but uh, the point is that all of this is happening at uh, scales of about the astronomical units. And it's very challenging to see it this directly from imaging and even from interferometry. Now with ALMA, we're starting doing something with very close objects, but in general, if you want a physical approach, uh, you need to use different techniques. And uh, the spectroscopy is, is the, the, the most useful technique for these things. This is why we, we love it so much. Um, okay, <clears throat> so if you've got a question for the moment, and don't mind being interrupted. Okay. If everything is fine, just <clears throat> go ahead. I need to define some parameters. The first one is the veiling. Uh, I will talk about it. And it is defined as the ratio between the um, infrared flux and the uh, flux of the um, stellar object. And it, uh, it defines how much veiled is the forming star because of all the accretion properties of the young stellar object. And then we do have the uh, mass accretion rate. 
So literally, how much mass is creating per year onto the forming star? And this is the equation. So basically, you need the uh, the luminosity due to the equation, the equation luminosity, and the solar perimeter of the stars. And um, then we have to know that the physics which regulate the disks, uh, as I said before, well, is not completely understood, but we know that um, it's like the viscosity and the winds play an important key role on this. And lastly, um, the evolution of all the young stars is composed not only on the evolution of the stellar mass, but uh, it's an interplay between the mass equation rate, the disk mass, and the envelope mass. So um, I will start with the mass equation ray. And uh, in particular, with uh, simulation. So um, observationally speaking, this field is very challenging. Uh, but uh, since 2000, uh, there are several simulations. This is what the one by Talbot, uh, which showed you that um, basically, so this is the mass equation rate as a function of the age. So it shows how the mass equation rate should evolve under a um, theoretical point of view. And you can appreciate here the, the steady part of the equation. Okay. So um, this, uh, this region here, and there are several works, and uh, um, in particular, uh, the, the recent uh, 57 chapter by Manara 2023 and Pineda 2023 uh, that describes this, um, this mass equation a lot. Um, and then, and this has been like demonstrated observational for the Titari part star, and it's working. Um, then we do have also the so-called reactive equation. Here you can see some burst that deviates from the steady part. And uh, uh, objects as X source and few or reverse um, are the like classical objects that experience uh, this strong, really strong um, eruptive equation due to probably the instability of the disk. Um, again, if you are interested in this, there is a lot of literature here. Um, okay, now we will focus our attention on the equation in class one and class two. Okay, why is it like that? Because for the moment we are able to uh, determine the mass equation rate of only for these two stages. As I said before, the uh, class three, there basically there is no equation anymore. Um, it's just a, a really short phase when the system is preparing to do the hydrogen burning. And about the class zero stage, so the previous one, um, it's so embedded that we cannot see the, the photosphere. So, um, for the class two, everything is well known. Um, in here, you can see, I mean, I just point here all the um, papers that, that investigate the search, and you can see that there is a lot of literature. And I also wanted to show you this plot with so many, so many regions where we do this, we've done this kind of analysis. Here you can see the mass equation rate as a function of the stellar mass. And you can see that different regions more or less show the same behavior with a lot of spread. And if you've got questions about the spread, you, you can ask me. Um, but then there is not only the, uh, the study of the mass equation rate as a function of the stellar mass, there is also the study of the mass equation rate as a function of this mass. And you, you, you can see that there is a relationship again uh, also with these uh, two quantities, which makes sense, right? Because according to the scenario that we built, there is some material from the envelope arriving to the disk, but then it's from the disk that it impacts uh, on the on the forming star. So we, we could expect that the more massive it is disk and the more material could it create onto the forming star. Um, and then there is Okay, the, the question, why is it like that? What is the physical mechanism that that uh, explain, describe uh, the, this scenario? We do have data for the class two solar system. Yeah, the problem is that the data are in agreement with uh, all the models that we, we got. In particular, here you can see the, the model trend. 
Here, different colors relate to different regions, uh, depending on their age, and also uh, the MST wind prediction and the uh, dust of uh, forming planets. And you can see that all, all the three of them could explain this, um, the data that we have because of the spread and also because of the fact that we are not looking at here, for example, where the, uh, for example, the viscous um, model is supposed to decrease a lot, uh, while the energy wind is supposed to be constant. And we, we also don't only have one region uh, with very cold, okay? For us, very cold is like more than five mega years. <clears throat> Okay, so, um, but coming back to the uh, to to the previous slides, to the evolution according to the models, um, we've seen that we are focusing on this region on classical Pitari stars, but then, like most of the mass accretion rate, according to the simulation, should happen before in the protostellar stage. So why we spend a lot of time? investigating the mass accretion rate here when we know at least because of the models uh, that should be like faint a little because it's easy <laughs> because it is what we what we can what what we can do because classical star stars emit uh, in the um, visible and UVB wavelength and uh, life is less complicated in that wavelength range as you know and also because like the equation tracers um, um, emit like are in that wavelength range. So here you can see an example. This is an uh, um, an extruder spectra of a classical Tetari star in in lupus, and uh, I marked all the equation uh, tracers with respect to the uh, like different region on the young stars. So you can see that the UV excess, which is what uh, like gives you how much luminosity, how much material is accreting onto the star, is here, okay? And in the case of a classical Kitari star, you, you can see this. It is not, this part of the spectrum is not covered by the dust. It is not covered by the envelope or the disk. Um, and then you can see all the boundary lines, the passion lines, the bracket lines in general, or all H lines in young stars traces the accretion and gives you information on the accretion. Um, and then there are also, I mean, uh, wind jet, either forbidden hydrogen and iron, and the CO. Um, you can also see the near infrared excess here. And this is important because, I mean, uh, in the dashed black line corresponds to the photostellar photosphere. Uh, if you do have the visible and uh, well um, ultraviolet spectrum, you you can study directly the, the photosphere. But if you have only the near infrared part of the spectrum, you don't see the stellar photosphere because of the near infrared excess. Okay, okay. Now, if this is uh, clear, we can go around. I mean, this is just the recipe that we use for for use for uh, computing the mass accretion rate on classical Pitari star. It can be more or less challenging because of your data, because of your experience with routine, but we, we know how to do it. Yeah, but what about objects that we are not able to see in the visible or in the UVB? If you remember an SED of a class zero or even a class one, like is is veiled is is not uh, possible to observe in UVB and visible. Okay, uh, thanks to people like uh, there is this work of Al Khalal Al 2017, but before them the same group in 2014 and also Muzerol et al in 1998 try to uh, determine these empirical relations between the accretion luminosity that we got directly from mm -hmm. UV excess and near infrared um, emission line. So here, for example, uh, we're interested in the bracket gamma line because it's the most uh, bright, uh, it is the brightest in the near infrared part. And the idea is that we can use these empirical relations that works for classical Tetari stars to observe more embedded and we think also youngest objects, for example, class ones. 
Ok. Ok. Um, so, this is what we've done. Basically, um, during my PhD, we um, developed this self consistent method that used the um, empirical algorithms uh, aforementioned. Um, the fact that the bolometric luminosity can be described as the direct form, uh, direct sum between the crucial luminosity and the stellar luminosity. We said that a young star object has different components. So in the end, the bolometric, the hover luminosity of the objects is composed by several um, <clears throat> luminosities. Uh, the like astronomical equation of the of the bolometric, where an important and key role is played by the bailing I introduced before. Um, but still, we've got three equations and too many three parameters. So we need some assumption. And based on Spitzer time scales, we can say that those objects should uh, have an age uh, between the birth line. So the, the, the first, um, the first locus when an object entered the HR diagram and one mega year old. According to Spitzer time scales, uh, it, it's very unlikely that uh, a protostar is older than one mega year. This uh, assumption could be even like uh, more precise because uh, in general, um, class one um, time scales are 0.5 mega years, but we decided to be conservative because you never know. Um, and this is what we get. So here you can say um, the mass efficient rate as a function of the stellar mass. So this is the exactly same plot that we, you've seen before, but this is only for NGC 1353, which is a very young cluster in Purcells. And in green, there are class twos. So exactly as the, the, the plot I showed you before. And then in pink and um, um, black, the class ones. First things to notice, the error bars, okay? Uh, and for class ones, we, we've got dots. For, oh, sorry, for class two, we've got dots. For class ones, we've got bar. Um, and mostly uh, this is because of the assumption that, that we made here. Um, so we can just like provide a locus uh, for each star, for each class ones. Uh, that that takes into account the possible uh, stellar mass and the cushion rate that the star could have. But still, it it, it provides you something. Uh, it gives you um, an order of magnitude at least. And uh, uh, okay. And coming back to the famous um, uh, to the famous plot, we can now like we test this part of the plot. Okay. So we are quite satisfied about this because it's more or less in agreement with what the um the models suggest. But we we we've done this analysis only for ten objects and only in a single cluster in a single star forming region. And we we, can, we cannot generalize this, right? Uh, so the next step was to go for a statistical approach. And uh, um, we selected 50 objects out of um, 110 known class ones for which it was possible to measure the bathing and to apply the self consistent method I described before. And uh, uh, this is what we get. So here you can see the equation luminosity as a function of the stellar luminosity. So this is different for, from what we've seen before, but it's however interesting because um, it tells you basically that those are class two, and then here colored um, um, objects are different class one samples um, with different veiling, and the front is the same for the less veiled surface, so the pink and red ones. But then if you uh, study the more veiled surfaces, so the, the most obscured by the envelope, they deviate a little from the, from the general trend you can see here, right? And uh, so based on this, you should expect like uh, a similar behavior on the mass accretion rate. So more or less the class two, will follow the class ones, the red and pink will follow the class two, and then the blue 
should be like should deviate a little. This is not what we see. <laughs> um, as you can see here, the um the class one is a very different population from the class two. Of course, the area of bars are quite large, and uh, of course there are some assumptions on this. But the point is that what we know less here are the stellar mass and the stellar radius that plays an important role in, in um, computing the mass accretion rate from the stellar luminosity. And also there is an observational bias because this is what we can do from ground-based facilities. So it means that we are only looking for the brightest plus ones because we cannot see the most embedded sources. And also the most failed uh, show the same as the question rate of the less days. Um, however, if we come back to the uh, famous simulation, now we enlarged the, the mass occlusion rate. So with more statistics, we were able to um, describe more or less all the uh, protostellar phase. The problem here is that, what well, the problem? <laughs> the, uh, we still are not able to um, um, cover the part with the strong mass accretion rate due to the eruptive event. Uh, all those objects are not known to, to being um, eruptively active. Uh, and the other point is that we, we base all of these on the Spitzer timescales. So under the assumption that the, um, the timescales of class ones is uh, 0.5 mega years, and in general, not more than one mega year. But if so, the idea is that if we just multiply the mass accretion rate for the time scale of this object, we should have more or less the um the uh distribution of main sequence stars or at least pre main sequence stars. This is not what we get. So um the mass accretion rate of class ones is higher of the mass accretion rate that or of class two, but still is not high enough to explain their mass. And this leads to two possible solutions. Either most of the mass is already accreted in the most embedded phase that we are not able to observe, at least not from ground-based facilities, or that uh, most of the mass is not accreted from steady accretion. It's just basically probably is due to this strong and not continuous eruptive accretion burst. It is a possibility. Okay. What we've done next, um, we studied the disk mass. You know that now with ALMA, we, we, we can provide, well, estimate of disk mass and uh, working on different, on a multi-wavelength approach, even accurate with uh, disk mass. <clears throat> and because we already knew the stellar parameters um, from the, um, from the analysis I just described, we wanted to study the instability of the disk. Because our reasoning was, okay, if the disk is unstable, then probably the point here, the, the, the key phenomenon is the eruptive accretion. If not, uh, maybe it's plus zero, maybe it's something else. So we use the uh, fractal and the criterion, uh, which is basically, which corresponds to this um, uh, light blue um, region. Uh, and add, so he, the, the symbols are the same, and also we added the orange um, orange objects that are class 0 and 1 from the literature. Um, we plot it here. And what we see is that uh, most of the objects, of the young objects, actually lay in here. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So um, the, we interpreted this as a possible like hint of the fact that more uh, class ones and zero that we think actually have experienced or will experience some eruptive event because of the, the fact that their disk is unstable. This is not like a, a definitive conclusion, uh, but I think that it suggests that um, we should take, or we should always take into account uh, eruptive accretion when we do this kind of, of analysis. Um, but then, I mean, as I said before, we for, for we've got this problem. What is the mechanism that drives accretion? 
I mean, either it's eruptive or it's steady. What is the physics underneath? And uh, for if we do this for class two, we've got the viscosity MSD winds uh, mm -hmm. provide, I mean, they are both in equipment. So if we, the, 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 the difference is here at the very early stages. And for this reason, because we wanted to populate this plot in this part uh, of the diagram, um, we study protostars. Because now we do have both the mass accretion rate and the disk mass. And for the first time, we uh, completed this plot. It, here, uh, it's the mass accretion rate as a function of disk mass for our class one sample. So first, you can see that there is a, a relation. So the this relation is still there only for class ones. And it's not so like uh, natural because um, uh, as we said before, the physics of class one is different. There is the contribution of the envelope. So it could be perfectly fine if those objects were just randomly um, <clears throat> uh, put in this diagram. Second, you see, an evolutionary trend from like more massive disks and higher mass accretion rate of class ones to um, less massive disks and uh, lower mass accretion rate of class two. And we're very happy about it. But mm -hmm. uh, the point is also that the, like, the, the relations are different. You see here that the slope and in um, the sigma are different within the error of the two population. So this plot is also suggesting us that those phases, the protostellar one and the premium sequence one, are, are different in this space of parameters. Okay. We wanted to study the depletion time. The depletion time can be seen as the uh, time by which the disk uh, is totally um, um, well, dissipated because it accretes uh, material on the on the star or because some wind. But the ratio between the ejection material and the accreted material is about one hundred. So we can say that most of the material is isn't going to create on the on the central object. And uh, I highlight here these four guys because they do have extremely short deflection time, like shorter than 10 to the four years. It, this, this, this is very short, right? Because if the time scales of these objects are 10, 10 to the four, how, how they can be like shorter than that? Um, oh, we don't know. We, we studied a lot of these objects. We have no idea. Uh, there are some things that we can take into account, like the uncertainty in cycle due before, and also the fact that we can improve our mass, the disk mass estimate, but these objects are not like brown dwarf or, or eruptive stars or strange guys. They're normal class ones objects. So we've done this. <laughs> we, we, we tried this exercise. We just remove those objects from the from from the sample for a moment, and we try again to to fit data. And now magic the the fit of the sample without these low disk mass guys is in agreement with plus two. This is telling us that we should investigate more the low disk class ones population. Um, again, we, um, we've done this kind of analysis. Uh, we pl overclocked isochrons. Isochrons are defined by the data 2017 as the locus, uh, where, uh, cl well, class two evolves. So the point is that thanks to isochrons, you can get the initial conditions of the disk and mass accretion rate. And this is very important because um, basically the initial condition for class two are class ones, and the initial condition for class ones are class zero. So if you do this, uh, you can get the initial condition for star and planet formation because the literature uh, is telling us that planet formation occurs during the protostellar phase. 
The problem is that isochrons are optimized for classical Tetari stars. So they don't take into account the, the fact that the envelope is, quail, is quailing the disk. Because as I said before, at a cluster stage, there is no envelope that fits the disk, right? However, if we just forget about this, um, uh, we say that there is no like trend, okay? The plus one um, objects are randomly point on different isochrons with different initial conditions and why is like that? I don't know, but my uh, uh, opinion is that we are looking to um, sample composed by objects in multiple star, um, uh, star forming regions. So we're not looking at just uh, a single star forming region. We're looking at uh, everything which is inside, which is within five and parsec, and we're trying to do the best that we can. Uh, but 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 we're missing information on the environment, and we know that the environment can affect a lot the initial conditions. So I, I want to stress that we need complete samples of the same suffering region for both protostars and plus two. So when you review. For example, is a proposal takes this into account that it's very, very important for this kind of, of studies. Um, okay, okay, finally, finally, we wanted to test the um the models. So MHD or uh, MHD wings. So is it the wings that take the material from the outer part of the disk <clears throat> and drive it on the inner part. It's, it's because of the winds that we that we see this equation going on, or is because the viscosity of the disk, or it's because basically both of them, and this is like the hybrid model. Okay, this is, th those are the lines. And okay, what is your conclusion looking at this plot? Say something. Yeah, yeah. And it, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, people try to convince me that the hybrid, uh, hybrid model will better fit like the evolution from plus ones to plus two, then then you still have the low disk plus ones that are not in this uh, framework. And uh, like me, this is telling us that nothing is working. But I'm not surprised by this, because as I said before, these models are set for classical Tetari stars, and we're looking at different stars. So why we're we using those models? Because those are the only models that are available for the moment. So another thing that we really need is people that build models that describe these different stellar phase. So if you know this topic, if you know people that know this topic, please try to convince them that we need models to compare our data. We are at the same that stage for which we've got more observation that data that can describe it. Okay, <clears throat> let's move to the envelope. I will go quicker on this. Um, the point here is that um, some theoretical works um, suggest that all I talk about is not really the key point because most of the material accretes directly from the envelope. I mean, I don't know if it's like that, but the, the, the problem here, and this is something that we share in common with people that do high mass affirmation, that maybe there is a mechanism that we don't know that is able to like um, accrete material directly from the envelope. This is something that we are not observing. Maybe it's an observational bias, but but what we are actually observing is material coming from the envelope to the disk. And thanks to Alma, there are a lot of uh, estimates of this. There are a lot of words. There is actually a review that, that tells you um, how much work is doing in, in this direction. The problem is still, still is that numbers don't don't fix the problem. Uh, this mass accretion rate is still too low. And uh, and also the uncertainties on the mass infall rate, so how much material came from the envelope to the disk, is even higher than the uncertainty that I got from the mass accretion rate. So there is a lot of work to do. Um, 
but the question still remains. If the class zero is the state in which the max is already set, we, we don't know the answer to, to this question. And before drawing conclusion, <clears throat> I would like to do some like watch out like first mm -hmm. uh, we analyze only loaded sources. So uh, I talked about class ones, but I should have talked about bright class ones, okay? Something that is still missing here is dim class ones that we cannot observe at the moment from ground-based facility. Um, what we need is a complete sample of single star of a single star from the region. I would get on for one to start uh, uh, to to see also the environmental um, framework and uh, to being able to draw a robust conclusion on this topic and to set initial conditions at least for one from southern region. And then we, I mean, we've done this only for single stars, but we know that more than half of the uh, main sequence stars are in binary system and that can be true also for protostars and pre-main sequence stars. So we should also take into account the multiplicity of the systems. Here's a list of the most recent and um, interesting works that, that, works, that claims this topic. Um, there is also, there are also outflows, uh, I, I only have 45 minutes, so I haven't focused on outflows, but, um, is this can be very important to study those objects that are embedded. So we cannot study the material directly creating, but since we, we see some outflow, we know that the, that object is accreting because of the outflow, because of the um, conservation of the angular momentum. And uh, uh, ah, this is amazing. Uh, there is also a variability problem. What we have done uh, is just to make um, a picture, a screenshot of what's happening in a single precise moment. But uh, those objects as variability like uh, um, about less than two magnitude uh, in, in the visible um, wavelength range. So things can be different and there is also this aspect to take into account. And lastly, this is only for low mass stars. We know that there are orbits and there are also high massive stars, uh, more massive stars. So um, we are far away, unfortunately, to uh, draw the uh, like star formation scenario, which is good because it means that there is some work for us to do. Okay, so uh, let me draw the take home messages, uh, which are a few for all the reasons that I described before. And those are that the mass accretion rates we observe are larger for younger sources. Th this, is, this is a fact. This is something I, I mean, we demonstrated this. And uh, this is important because we observe these uh, within class two at different stages because MGC 1333 class two accretes more than more evolved um, uh, star from regions. And uh, it's true between class one and class two. Uh, but if we analyze class ones in different regions, uh, we cannot draw like definitely robust conclusions on the behave, like on the relations between the mass equation rate and the stellar parameters, including the disk mass. Okay, so next steps. On the theoretical side, we need models. Uh, I know that Patrick and Bell Group in Paris is working on something like this. And uh, maybe in the future, there will be some, some uh, yeah. like improvement on this. Uh, I've been told that uh, is like a, a numerical problem because the integration time that you need to follow the behavior of a star or population of a star from the core collapse to the cluster stage is it's a lot. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. there is room for improvement on this side. On the observational side, we can do a lot of things. I mean, I know that we can do a lot of things because this is my um, uh, like field of expertise. Again, we need uniform samples. 
Um, we need to further investigate the low lift mass regime to see what's going on, to see if the difference in the relation that uh, corresponds to a completely different population for cos one is just like due for due to some of the layers or it's a fact. And in order to do this, we have to do two things. Increase the number of observed objects and like focus our attention on low disk mass. Luckily, we managed to get some data. So we're working on this. Stay tuned because uh, we'll be able to see what is, what is the output, I hope soon. Um, also, we need to investigate more embedded objects, more embedded class ones, and more embedded and like class zero. How to do this? Uh, for the moment, we're using only the bracket gamma lines, but there are also other H1 lines. And uh, the idea is to get empirical relations also for the other H1 lines in the uh, near infrared. We're working on doing this with the Penelope data set. Because as you can see here, um, like all the bracket series is something that we we actually observe. And we observe these not only for class, like normal classical class one and class two, but also for exors, for cures, for eruptive objects. So um, investigating these, these lines that are usually like forgot, uh, it's very important, okay? And um, also taking into account always eruptive accretion is, is always important. But there are, however, objects that continues to be dim in the near infrared part. And what we can what you can do, move toward longer wavelengths, move to the mid-infrared um, part of the spectrum. Uh, there are some attempts of finding relations on the mid-infrared H1 lines. This is a work by Elizabeth Tatiliaco 2015 and Comoral and Fisher 2020. As you can see here, the error bars are very large, right? So, I mean, you can fit this wherever you want. And here, the problem of this work is that the uh, flex calibration was not contemporary, so there is a, a problem in the variability. So, of course, there are like good, good works because you have to start somewhere, right? But uh, due to the uh, low uncertainties on this relationship, we cannot use this for the moment to do the same analysis that we've done with bracket gamma. So uh, Alessio Caratteratti is the PI of an Aries GTO that we have at Tina, And the idea was that Aries would observe contemporary to JWST Miri, a sample of class two to get these empirical relations. This is the size was successfully only partially because as you know, Miri had some problems. So a lot of targets unfortunately were not observed at the same time. So we're working on this, but we're not sure that we will able to provide these empirical relations. Uh, we will do our best. Mm -hmm. mm, lastly, uh, for doing this, we need new facilities. And I already mentioned uh, MIRI JWST, which is already working. So good, very, very good. Um, but there is also another instrument that is very important for this kind of science, and this ELT METIS. So also ERI is observing the mid infrared, amazing, but well, it's it's not enough for the science that we can that we would like to do. Um, the fact that METIS have a coronagraph would be amazing. I mean, the idea by which METIS was developed was because why well, I mean, to study planets formation. So if you cover the contribution of the star, you can focus on, on planets on the disks. But this is also important um, if you need to identify like uh, the contribution of the envelope or the disk. So the idea is to work on two like phases, study the envelope, the disk, and then put on also the contribution of the star. And in this way, we will get only the contribution of the star. So the idea is to use the coronagraph like mm -hmm. two times uh, to get information on the star. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is like the next step, uh, like general conclusive slide. I uh, thanks you, thanks a lot for your attention and I welcome any question.
Okay, well, thank you very much, Eleonora. Uh, is there any question here? Maya, if you can say your name, so Eleonora can get to know you. Uh, I'm Maya Sorio. Thank you very much for this very clear talk. I have several questions. The first one, uh, it would be great to have evolutionary track for class zero from class one to the start that there are still a great in a lot of the area, which is very difficult to find. But regarding the relation that you have shown the, uh, between the, this mass as in the athletic luminosity, I think. Uh, stop me when you're happy with this. Uh, this one. This one? This one. Okay. Uh, I guess you, you mentioned that in this mass is obtained from Alma network, but I am a um, bit concerned because Alma underestimates many people underestimate mass because they assume that this is this optical fluid that the temperature is constant. Can you answer this problem? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so. um. Those observations, so those estimates of the disk mass were based on band, band six, ALMA band six. And uh, so if you use like the Ansdell uh, model to do this, you basically either set the temperature or change the temperature, but however, you assume that the object is optically thin. And we don't know if this is true for class ones and it could be not true. It's also true that um, by setting the temperature, like I think it's uh, 20 Kelvin, mm -hmm. like those objects are supposed to be um, uh, colder. So people argue that for plus ones, you kind of balance, like there is a, an assumption that um, uh, will provide you like, more massive disk and then another assumption that will provide um the other way around. Uh so we argued this. We were not convinced about this, of course, but the point is that uh, we've done two things. First, we asked for band three. And uh, also uh for most of these objects there is also um uh a VLT observation. VSI observation. So what we're working uh, for the OFIGU sample for the low disk mass and contemporary for those objects for which we managed to have band 3 and VLT <coughs> is to compute the spectral index in order to know if it's optically thin or thick, and then use the method as a consequence, like if they're optically thin or if they're optically thick. Okay. Okay, um, but this is not what we've done here. And the, the reason why we didn't have done here is, well, it's, there are two reasons. First, we didn't have the enough data for all the sample. And the second was that we wanted to like, uh, just uh, like to compare exact, like to use the same method used for class two for class ones. <clears throat> so, here I put like this mass, be, but this is more or less like the flux, the alma flux in band seven per a certain coefficient, which is the same for class two and class one. So like in the letter, we like discuss these as um like the relation between the mass efficient rate and the, and the flux of the alma band six. Also to convince people that 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 this is not a good way to do this assessment. Yeah, but it, it's very challenging. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that that's more more important than the, the radiation from the start this stage. Um, what we are trying to do. So we discussed these at the court to do this conference. I don't know if some of you were there. Um, the problem is that like getting time with Alma. <laughs> 
it's <laughs> very difficult. Uh, but and also, I mean, if, if you ask for this, people tell you, yeah, but you already have this guesstimate. So why you need further bands? And and that's 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 something uh, stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I honestly think that it's easier to go for a large project with Alma, honestly. Uh, so I don't know. If you're interested in doing this, we can work together uh, because I, I keep not only me i mean all the people that i know i keep keep uh, asking for um different bands in a single region and we are not successful is there any other questions here in the room no, not for you right do you want to make another one yeah please i i have a concern regarding the classic region because you have derived these parameters from So for this sample, we we checked because we've got like for NGC thirteen thirty three, we've got I few observation. There were no jet. <clears throat> so I mean, there is no jet. For the other for the other sample, uh, there were no like jet tracers. Um, we checked the two mass images to see if we were able to see the presence of a jet. They are, were not contemporary, so we don't really know. Um, so it could be, but for <clears throat> I mean, if those objects are so bright, mm -hmm. it means that are very close to the cluster stage. Therefore, it means that it's very unlikely that they have some jets. The more embedded is the source, and the more and the youngest it is, and the higher is the possibility that there is some jets there. And this is why we cannot use this, this method to study more embedded objects. And this is why we need more lines that trace different things to be able to constrain the things and avoid the contamination, the, the jet part. Uh, but in principle, you don't know. But only, I mean, I would only to stress the fact that, I mean, we use these relations based on the bracket gamma as a constraint, but if you, if you use only the bracket gamma, then you, you you are not able to estimate this because you have so many uh, free parameters. So um, you cannot just use empirical um, relations if you've got your flux calibrated bracket gamma and this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. I know because I mean people are starting doing this on papers. Okay. Yeah. Yes, now I must ask to see streamers from the end of the list. I must suggest to the end or a question talk. This was your big single in the world. So you can to make, uh, well, it's an error, it's an exciting thing, but you can to make the rate of the volume from the end of the Yeah. So, um, okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, this is something that I personally haven't done. But the, so those people have done it. And and I think it's I mean it's key because um so I'm I, I focus my work on the mass expression rate. And this is not enough. We need more material. So the fact that the some material is accreting uh I mean it is coming from the envelope to the disk is important because it tells you, I mean, that um there, there is more fuel on the disk, and the, it's tell, it tells you that the instability, I mean, the, 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 uh, the instability of the disk could be affected by this material, right? And again, this is very important because otherwise we find like a physical mechanism that is able to convert all the material that is coming from the info to the, to the star. Or, I mean, 
we have to accept that the eruptive equation is not something uncommon. Uh, and, and 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 people are not convinced about about it, but I I don't know. We have to demonstrate this. Uh, also, I mean, they find stream. Also, they find streamers. They found streamers on class two. And and this is weird because I mean I mean we all the all the paradigm that we built uh uh um, says that the envelope is dissipated on class two, and we can forget about envelope on class two. But this is not what Alma is telling us. Of course, we need statistics, but uh, this is interesting because uh, like, if there is still envelope accreting the disk on class two stage, this, I mean, at least says two things. First, that the models that we are using are completely wrong and they don't even describe the class two evolution. And second, that class two and class one are more alike than we think because this mechanism is still going on also on the classical sitar stage. That's very interesting. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the possible um, uh, like description, description of the eruptive accretion is the instability of the disk. So basically when the disk is more massive than like self gravity that can be because of self gravitating, it it produced this strong burst that should follow magnetic lines if there are man if the magnetic field of the forming star is so is so is already formed and uh, and uh, intense. What we don't know during the class zero stage if if uh, it's uh, if the magnetic field at that stage is already formed. Is it is it polar? Is strong enough? Uh, people are starting doing this kind of of, of research like now. Okay, so how can I talk about the beginning? I am Thank you for the for the talk. So I I have a comment. You 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 say that the that the key of everything seems to be to work from the same star from the region. But I, I have some concerns about all this because, and you see that in 33, the you mention it, there is a large diversity of objects. So I, I have studied this for, for the region for a while and I cannot see two identical objects. So the objects probably have similar ages, like one had the bigger bead or the bigger one set of spirals, or the other had very compact bees, or one set very powerful outflows, even very powerful chemical objects, or the uh, jets. So I, I, I always prefer the study in deep of mm -hmm. the objects rather than statistical of many objects that are, are not really studied in deep. So, well, this is my opinion. You comment maybe you want to comment more on that. Uh, so it's just based on my personal experience. Like during my PhD, I work with very different groups. Um, one both based in Rome. One was focused on on a statistical approach with actual data and like cover all the galaxy and 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 do these things on large scale. What well, large scale? First goal that, but large numbers. Um, saying that going and studying little objects didn't give you information on the general picture. And then I work with uh, another group, uh, the Bible and Lanzini, that that does what you're saying. Take an object and study everything of the stellar parameters, detail, mass equation rate, outflow, every traitor, every a multivariant approach, and that. And it says that. In this way, we can establish something. Otherwise, if we go for a statistical approach, we're losing information. I personally think that, I mean, it, why would the science? Because we've got a question and we want to answer that question. So if the question is, what's going on in that star? We go and look that star. If, our, if the question is, what is the physical mechanism that drives material coming from the other part to the inner part. I mean, 
we, we have to go for a statistical approach. It's not like the one is better than another one. Everything depends, depends on your scientific question. So what is your scientific question? You said it and you like compute all the yeah, like your observational program proposal and everything. I, I personally don't like when, when in a proposal they say, yeah, by studying this first, I want to answer this fundamental question of the physics. You, you can this is not, this is, I, you cannot say this by only studying one object. But if you say this object is strange because it's doing something that we don't understand. So I want to observe it. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course you, you should got the data. So it depends on, I personally think that it depends on your scientific question. I disagree with the sentence you, you said, because in my opinion, if you want to do physics, you have to do physics. Other, otherwise, you are doing statistics, you are doing mathematics, which is different. <laughs> so my point is that if you want to understand the, the physics, you, you have to study. You and several objects in it. So you know the methods that are working on. And then once you know the methods, or when you know how to calculate the mass of a disk, when you know how to estimate the age of the object, or, or when you know this, how to do this, then you can do this for a large sample. And then to draw additional information on the statistical properties. But what I am emphasizing always, older also, is to reverse the project, the, pro the problem, no? So you have to do the statistic later, not the statistic first, mm -hmm. with, for example, poor calculation of the mass of the disease, because you, you, you got some, uh, a strange results sometimes. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking with, with Pedro. He told me, well, we are doing something wrong because we, we see that the, the Eduard stars, the mass of the planets is larger than the mass of the disk of the object. But no, you are not doing things wrong. It's the people that is calculating the mass of the disk, assuming that the mission is mm -hmm. is doing something wrong. So you better last this most of the mission is of the team, but you might be obtained in ninety percent for it. But if you have an M Warka star, for example, when the data are smaller, the central region is denser, and you make a big error assuming, for example, that the mission is of the team. Yeah, but and, and this can then give contradiction. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. maybe a philosophical approach, but uh, I, I I think there is a problem here in 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 some cases. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, as as long as you describe what have you done and people can reproduce what you're doing, mm -hmm. I think it's fine. You're doing science. Mm -hmm. The problem is that when you publish a paper and and people don't have access to the data and cannot reproduce and just have to trust you, mm -hmm. that that's a problem, right? I don't feel we're fair. We, we, we do the best that we can with the data that we have in the end. Well, I think we have to call that. I think it's a very nice discussion, philosophical discussion, but I think we need to leave it here. Um, I'm ready to talk after one object versus a systematic uh, uh, approach. And in the consultant, I don't think we're going to have time to answer here. But before we close to announcements, first, we're going for lunch now. So whoever wants to join, join us. We're going to the groups, right? Somebody place around the corner and the second announcement is that uh Eleonora will be here today and tomorrow and tomorrow I have organized a session because Eleonora for a great scientist she's also very active in the gender equality community and tomorrow I have asked her kindly she has accepted that she tell us very informally what she does what she has been involved because I